What is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting 1 in 10 people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain, where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination and in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady and takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. It is relentless and, for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Learn more at www.aboutalz.org. So there you go. Now you know as much as probably everybody knows about this one. You know about as much as the experts do now. The next one is one that uh, is kind of an introduction for Ron, uh, and I'll do a little bit of introduction. He has uh, six degrees, one of them is 98.6. Yeah, yeah. The other five uh, are, uh, he has uh, quite a few degrees in religion and uh, criminal justice. Uh, he was a chaplain in the uh, prison system here in Oklahoma, uh, and thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, he was doing that when he was diagnosed at home. He'll tell you a little bit more about himself, but he's my hero. Uh, I can do this. <clears throat> We've known each other for about eight years. He was diagnosed a little bit after my wife was, and uh, he's just a miracle. That, you know, he's here, and can you, obviously he's here for a reason, and, and the reason is to talk to people like you and tell you of what is going on in the mind of somebody who has Alzheimer's. I can tell you what's going on from a caregiver's side, but very, there, there's lots of us out there. There aren't very many of him out there. Um, so uh, I've already told him, so you guys can forget this, if I'm ever diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I get half of his blood. Uh, as soon as I get diagnosed, we're going someplace, 
and have that transfusion done because I don't know what's in there, but I want it. Uh, his wife is just an absolute jewel, um, and uh, they're they're kind of the model of what you would look for in people that are dealing with Alzheimer's. So I will show you. Uh, he did a little video. He's done a lot of videos. But this one is on a relationship between somebody who has Alzheimer's and their uh, spouse. One of the things about this disease is it changes your life. It causes you to have to become adaptable to situations and circumstances. As far as, as trying to cope with frustrations that come up between Vicki and I, and Vicki's my care partner, my wife. I try very diligently to remember all the time that this has been a major, major change in her life and the way she has to live and her, how she has to think and then how she has to interact with me. So I, I try to keep in mind all the time that I'm around her that she is having to live with this disease also. She's not the one with the disease, but she's having to live with it. And so, as I might be asking for special consideration from her from time to time, I need to go ahead and give that to her. We get anxious, we get frustrated, we, and we have a tendency to take it out on those that are closest to us at the time. And I just try really hard not to, to do that anymore. Really hard. Because I want the time that we have left together to be the best that it can be. So, without further ado, <laughs> Spike. That's just how I dress when I go down and, and work at the. Uh, uh, yeah, we're not filming this, are we? Uh, but anyway, uh, I go down to Spike, and this is what I, I like my hair up when I'm working at the uh, walk in Alzheimer's. So, if you come down at 5:30 in the morning and help us set up. You can look for Spike. So anyway, <laughs> my best friend, Ron. Aww. Where do you want me to do? Am I supposed to stand over here? Stand Anywhere here? you want to. Okay. Well, I'm probably, Whatever you feel comfortable. I'm going to probably chair, end up but... against here. Okay. I don't do good standing for long periods of time. Just a quick housekeeping here. Uh, very. This is going to be very informal. At any point in time, if you have a question or a comment you want to make, or feel free to stop me because I, I do not, as you notice, I don't have a script here, so we're not following the script. So it's just, we need to get, get to you students what you need the most, and that's what we're going to try to do at this point in time. But uh, I was 55 years old when I was diagnosed. With, with Alzheimer's. Uh, I'm just going to give you a brief history on, on me. And it came about after an incident that happened one Saturday where my daughter was telling a story and I said, no, I was not there. Uh, she, this, at this time, my daughter was grown, had two kids living three doors down from us. And I have two daughters, both of them grown. And we were sitting there, and she's telling the story. And I'm going, no, I wasn't there. She said, Daddy, you were. I said, no, I wasn't. She said, yeah, you were. I said, no, I wasn't. You and your mother and your sister get together, and you girls go and do stuff and think you told me. And <laughs> No. Well, so I said, please tell it as if I wasn't there. And so she did. And in the process of her telling it, I realized I had been there. And I never got the whole picture. I never regained the, the entire memory. And having been in school as much as I have been, you know, and just like with y'all, you know, y'all don't remember everything y'all been taught in these classes. There's certain things that you do remember, certain that you don't. Well, that's normal forgetting. That, that's 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 just normal. But I knew that 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 forgetting that I had in regard to that instant didn't feel normal was not what I considered normal forgetting. So when I saw my PCP for my annual physical, uh, he asked me if there was anything else we needed to discuss. And I said, well, I may have some problems with my memory. And 
And so he sent me to a neurologist and sat down and talked with the neurologist. And he said, well, you're, you're functioning quite well right now. But he said, well, let's start some tests and see if we can find out what it's not. So we started with blood work, and then we just kept going through a series of tests, eliminating things that possibly could have caused it. Came down to a point that we did an MRI, and then there were some spots on the MRI that he calls me up and says, I'm not comfortable with that, not at your age. We don't typically see that in a scan, so I'd like to do a PET scan. I said, okay. So did a PET scan. And all this took several months to process through all this stuff. And so finally, uh, we got the results back from the PET scan, and I'm sitting there and trying to read it, and I, I don't understand all the, the medical lingo that's on that PET scan. But I did understand the concluding paragraph, and in that concluding paragraph, it said, we find the damage to your brain consistent with that of early Alzheimer's disease. I went, ooh. Uh, wasn't prepared for that. I had no clue that that just, that, that just didn't enter into my mind as being a possibility. You know, I was hoping, well, I should open in a brain tumor or something, you know. I don't know. You know, you think of all the things it possibly could be, and that wasn't one of them. We don't have uh, <clears throat> Alzheimer's does not run in my family, so it wasn't something that, you know, there, there is that familiar gene that, that uh, does seem to pass on, but not in my family. And so, uh, I didn't know much about the disease. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how it's going to affect me. I didn't know how long I'd have to live. Of course, for, at that point, I, I assumed that there was some way that they could treat it. But in the report that I got, after it had the concluding paragraph, the statement was, uh, this, is a, this is a progressive neurological disease. Uh, if, if you have any questions, please, come, please set an appointment Otherwise, I want to see you in I think it's three or four months. And please come by the office. I'll have some. Uh, I'll have some uh, prescription for you at the front desk. So, well, I got questions. <laughs> and when I finally, and so I get to reading about the disease. I get to studying about it, and then you, you get to asking. And, and the thing about it is, there's while we study so much about it, there's still so little really known. I, you know, I finally I sit down and talk with him and I said, well, what? Okay, I, by this time I know it's, it's, it's terminal. There, there's no cure for it. But what are we going to do? Well, not much we can do. I said, okay, well, what should I expect next? I mean, what kind of progression should I expect? Well, I can't tell you. And I'm going, huh? Well, you know, it, affects everybody individualistically and we just can't, I can't tell you what this is. Okay, well, how long do I have? Can't tell you. Here again, it affects everybody differently. And so it, it had no answers. All the questions I asked, he had no answers. And it, it's kind of frustrating, but you know, now as I look back on it and all I realize, he's just telling me what he knew and that was that what they just don't know. The video you watched there with talking about the disease, in a sense, that's almost an oversimplification of it. That is a very good description of what happens. But it says it's here, and then it moves here, and then it moves here, and then it moves here. That's not altogether accurate. Because sometimes it may be here, and then sometimes it may move here, and then sometimes it may move there. It, it's There's just no one, two, three of it. There are some things that are general trends and general patterns, <coughs> but there's just no textbook that you can look at and see, you know, here's one, here's two, oh, okay, you're doing this, well, this will come next. No, that's not the case. Uh, like with me, even, you know, he's talking about how toward the end hallucinations start becoming. And, and uh, everything he said is true. There is variations of that. But to talk about hallucinations at the end of it, there's times I'm sitting in the living room and I'll see something running across the floor. Well, it's not there. And I have to remind myself, it's not there. So I guess if a mouse ever runs across it, it's got a free ride, but I'm going to assume it's, it's not there. I'm going to give it credit for being a hallucination. So maybe 
So maybe it's not always all that good. So, but just wanted to let you know, because you'll be working with patients, and I, I don't want you to be under the assumption that, well, this can't be going on with them because this is supposed to happen first, and since this hadn't happened, this can't be. No. Throw that out the window. Please throw that out the window, because that's not the case. And as Herb said, we've been in a support group for uh, a number of years together, and out of that support group, there was another man and, I, and myself uh, approached the Alzheimer's Association and asked if we could have a support group for us with the disease. And then if our caregivers wanted to meet, they could meet in another room, but we wanted to meet by ourselves. And for nearly eight years, I guess, we've been doing that. The other gentleman that was involved in the starting of that, he's now in a nursing home. I'm not sure if he's in one over in in, in Hot Springs, Arkansas, or where she wound up with me, but he's in a home now. And Herb's wife, Gail, was very early on coming to that group. Well, out of the original people that met in that group, I'm the only one that's not dead in the nursing home. Herb's wife has passed about a year and a half ago. Lance in the nursing home. And of the rest of them, every one of them is dead. Uh, the original ones are all dead. So, yeah. now, we've had a lot since then that's died, and several are in nursing homes now. So, uh, watch this disease progress in people's life. Very thankful that my, the progression has been slow with me, slower than what they expected. They eventually did tell me, said, well, at your age, it usually progresses faster, and Typically, it's going to be two to eight years you'll be dead or in a nursing home. Yeah. May I ask, sir, how old are you? At this I'm 65. Uh -huh. I'm 65 yeah. now. That's it's been, amazing. It's been 10 years. Uh, 10 years. Oh, 10 years. <laughs> and I've had a second PET scan that uh, confirmed the results of the first one. And I just got through taking, just a couple weeks ago, my second neuropsych test. And it showed... It, it, here again, it once again confirmed the, the dementia. But why is it why is it affecting me differently? Progress slower? Oh, there's a, there's I hear different uh, different guesses at it, and uh, I don't know. It could be right, could be wrong. I was in a phase three study drug study for a while, and, and I think that that probably had some positive effects. Uh, they tell me that because I had enough education, it seemed like maybe mm -hmm. that, it, that helped stave off some of the symptoms. Uh, I also say if it wasn't for God, I sure enough, mm -hmm. His grace and mercy, mm -hmm. I sure enough wouldn't be doing as well as I am. Mm -hmm. But what a part of what I attributed to also is that my wife and I quickly decided how are we going to live with the disease? Because you can't cure it, so you're going to have to live with it. So how are you going to live with it? Are you going to, excuse me, you're going to bitch and moan about everything going on? Or are you going to, you know, look for the silver lining? And that's what we chose to do. I'll put it this way. You know, I cannot do, there's little I can do, if anything, to affect the way the pathology works in my brain. The disease is going to do what the disease is going to do. Now, I do have a choice how I react to some of the things that that pathology is doing. For instance, uh, as Herb told you, I've got multiple degrees and, and I was a good student. I was a real good student. I used to could sit down with a book. I could, you know, I'd say two, three hundred page book. I could skim it, scan it in two, two and a half, three hours. You take a test on it, and they said, it wasn't any big deal to me to do that. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I didn't try to be showboated about it or anything, but that's just, <laughs> that's just the way I functioned. Uh, all four of my degrees, after my bachelor's degree, all four of them, even my doctor, I had 4.0 in those. So, I was accustomed to being able to learn and learn pretty easily. 
So you're a genius. No, but I shark. I shark, okay? I shark. I can remember things quite easily and quite well. But uh, so now, there's there's the history. That doesn't mean much to anything now, you know. I can take that in a dollar and pretty much go to any vending machine I want to get me up soda, you know. That's about what that's worth. But uh, now of course maybe a dollar and a half. <laughs> I'm sure that's showing my memory. But but I tell you that to tell you this. Now, I cannot sit down and read a book through. I can still read the words, and I can sit down and read Wikipedia articles and make sense of them and all. But to read a book, I can't sit down and follow a book, the storyline of a book from start to finish. If I get up and go pee, I'm in trouble. Because I lost what was going on and what I was reading, you know. Well, to someone who was accustomed to, to being able to read it, pretty much whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted it, to now not be able to, to read a book anymore. A good friend of mine, real, real good friend of mine, wrote a, a book, it's it's a theological book, he wrote it on, it's called My Amazing Lord. And this guy has a way of writing about Jesus that is so simple. It makes it, it just beautiful to read. No, I, I, and he sent me a copy of his book when he wrote it. I've never been able to read it. I've started it, I don't know how many times, but I've never finished it. There's no I might as well start in the middle of the book or at the end of the book. It doesn't matter because I'm not going to be able to trace it. Well, that's what I mean by determining how you're going to handle the pathology. I could be real upset, real depressed over the fact I can't read anymore. I'd be real upset because I can't read that book. He, my good friend of mine excited to give me a book, and I can't even read it and tell him what I think about it. I just, did you get my book? Yeah, thank you. I couldn't say, that's great. <laughs> I can't tell him. I know it would be, but I can't tell him. So I can be real upset about that, or either I can say, okay, I can't do that anymore, and then look to see what can I still do. I enjoy doing that. You know, I started out telling you, you know, so I don't have notes and script here so I can be informal. Well, I'll be honest, that's a little deceptive because if I had notes, I probably wouldn't be able to follow them. Okay. So it's best for me to just talk off the top of my head. <laughs> because if I try to follow my notes, I'm probably not going to be real successful at that, okay? So that's why we just ramble a little bit. And it may be why I bounce back and forth a little. But I can still talk, I can still communicate, and so I enjoy doing it. So you look to see what you can do. And so my wife and I started trying to make sure, and here's three things that are our worst enemy, with us with the disease, I'll tell you that up front. Stress, fear, and anxiety. Those three things will cause our symptoms to be worse and it can either be any one or all three of them combined. But the higher the level of those are, the worse we're going to act, the worse we're going to behave, and the harder you're going to have to deal with us. Plain and simple. I mean, that's just... So, we recognize that. And so we started looking at what does stress, what causes, what, and what are some of my fears, and what causes me to be anxious. And we've tried to eliminate as much of that as we possibly can. You were all upset about being coming here late today, about mm -hmm. getting here late. Yes. You know how much that affected me? None. None. It shouldn't affect you either. Yeah. There's no reason to stress over it. Mm -hmm. You know, I could have said, well, wait a minute, I was supposed to start. Yeah. You know, we're running late. <laughs> we're going to start when we start, we're going to finish when we finish. Okay? If y'all tell me, if you get the if you get the hook and grab me by the neck and draw me out here because it's my time's up, well, then that's okay. I don't get upset there either, you know? So just try to live as stress-free of a life as I possibly can. Now, that's somewhat hard to do because there's things that stress us all the time. You know, can't find the TV channel at all. Where's that channel? I didn't move it, you know? But you just don't let those things bother you. So as you work with us, be aware of some of that. Be, be aware of those things. And, and now, as I said, my 
dementia and Alzheimer's does not run in my family, but before my mother passed away the last few years of her life, she did develop dementia, and it's vascular dementia. She had had some uh, TIAs that had caused her some brain damage and caused her to have dementia. Well, my mom and dad were married 66 years, had known each other 72 years. So now, there wasn't anything that one didn't know about the other. I mean, they were, when they talk about two becoming one, they'd lived together long enough, they really were basically one, living in two bodies. But as mom and dad had done over the years, if one of them started telling a story, and they were kind of missing something or forgetting something, the other jumping in and filling it in. And so the, it wasn't one normally telling the story, it was both of them. Well, as mother's uh, dementia started showing more signs, uh, there was one instance we were all sitting and talking and mother was telling the story and she had it all wrong. She wasn't anywhere, anywhere near right on it. And so my dad, trying to be the good, helpful husband, he starts correcting her so she'd get it right. He didn't want her to be embarrassed and tell the story wrong. Well, she getting ticked off. She knew what happened. Don't tell me what happened. I know what happened. I was there. And so she's, she's getting frustrated. Well, Dad's getting frustrated because he can't help her. So he just keeps pushing. And this is kind of a snowball rolling down the hill, and we know what happens there. And it was about to get pretty ugly. Well, Dad finally goes into the kitchen to do something, and I get up and follow him in there, and I said, Dad, stop it. He said, what am I doing? I said, leave Mother alone. Dad, she doesn't know. What she's telling you is what she believes. And what she remembers, leave it alone. Let it be that. Can't you see how frustrated she's getting? He said, yeah, but that's because she can't remember. No, it's not because she can't remember. It's because you're trying to tell her something different. Yeah. Leave her alone. And, and he kind of had, I could see the look on his face, kind of like the light bulb goes off moment, you know. And he goes, oh, oh. We go back in there. Mother continues to tell her story. Dad doesn't know his mother. And everything's fine. So a lot of times when we, and talking about people with the disease, when we start telling you something or disagreeing with you on something, the best you can, you need to agree with us as much as you can or divert us. Move us on to something else. Get our, get our mind refocused. And, and I tell it this way so much, most of the time. You know, if I tell you I went to Hawaii last week, I didn't go to Hawaii last week. But if I tell you I did, ask me how the pineapples were. <laughs> Don't tell me, oh no, I saw you last week down at Walmart. No, I wasn't. I was in Hawaii. No, I saw you at Walmart. Don't get in an argument with me because you're not going to win it. Because I know where I was at. But once, once I talk about the pineapples, then you can say, oh, now, we need to go do this. Oh, okay, let's go. But if you're arguing with me over where I was last week, you're not going to move me from that spot that I'm in. And I'm going to stay in there because, understand something, we realize that we are sliding down the hill, so to speak, and we don't like it. And we don't like you telling us that we're wrong, which proves that we're sliding down that hill. That's just going to cause us to dig our heels in and, and be that much harder to, to deal with. Because, you know, nobody, nobody wants, how would y'all like to find out that tomorrow they diagnose you and say, oh, well, you're fixing, one of the best tools you have, your brain, is fixing to be ate up by a disease we can't help, and it's going to kill you. That's not a very cheerful prospect. And so, that's what we're faced with. And, and we know the reality of it. We understand the reality of it. And when we, we don't like what it's doing, you know, you ladies are, are studying that. Did it, CNA, is that what y'all are? CNA. Okay. So y'all have a goal. Y'all, 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 you've got a plan. You're going to finish up this class, then you're going to go get jobs, you're going to enter your career, you're going to make a living for yourself, your families. I mean, you've got a plan. You've got a future. And you're planning for that future. And you're trying to figure out 
what's going to be the best for me, and you're trying to put those pieces in place so it'll work out for you, well, guess what? When they diagnosed me with Alzheimer's, they jerked my future from me as far as a career. They jerked it from me. It's gone. Now what am I supposed to do? That's what my life is, sitting around twiddling my thumbs. And so you're going to be dealing with people that they've had their identity stripped from them. Because we identify who we are by what we do. Which isn't really accurate, but that's what we do anyway. We identify. Oh, well, run. Uh, who are you? Oh, I'm a chaplain with the Department of Corrections in Oklahoma. No, that's what I did. But if you'd asked me, I'd have probably told you that's who I was. Well, when you take our, our professional identity away from us, it just leaves us dangling out there. And as we're dangling out there, we're losing stuff all along. And it just keeps, it just keeps going downhill, not getting any better. And so it's a matter of how do we come to grips with that reality and with that world? And it's not easy. And we've had some in our support group just didn't do it. Uh, I, I can think of one lady, uh, she hadn't been there in a while, but she still really doesn't want to accept the fact that she can do nothing about the fact she's been diagnosed with this disease. Well, if you stay in that mindset, life's going to be hell. Because you can't do anything about it. So if you can't do anything about it, what can I do in spite of it? And that's what really try to encourage people to try to do and to move into that type of thinking about it. That does not mean that every day is a good day because there's, there, there's some days that aren't good days, aren't pleasant days. And there's some days that I want to crawl under a rock and be left alone. But I try to remember when when I feel like that in those in those days that I go and sit in my recliner and either sleep or watch TV. And by the way, I do not watch Jerry Springer in those type shows. <laughs> no TV's on. I don't try. I try to watch something that is a, a little more educational or at least a little more entertaining than, than that. Uh, so. But I have to remind myself that, okay, this is today, tomorrow's another day. May I ask, sir, does the weather also affect your mood? And is there a reason why most Alzheimer's usually watch the news on a continuous basis? How do you feel about that? Okay, first question. Weather really doesn't seem to affect me any more now than it used to. You know, uh, since I've gotten older, I don't like it real hot. It just seems to take your breath away when you walk outside. But that's just maybe I don't think that has anything to disease. I think it just has to do with I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like cold weather. What about a full moon? Full moon? I just howl at it. <laughs> 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 that's something to look forward to every 28 days, you know. <laughs> that, that's kind of like party time. We're going to test the clips, though. <laughs> See how that works out, yeah. In, in your second question, your, your, your second question, uh, restated. Um, uh, oh, news. The news. The okay, news, I lost yes. it for a minute. That's okay. I, I would suspect that the reason probably a lot of times they're get so wrapped up in watching the news is it's a way to stay in touch with what's happening. Because otherwise, it's just my little world and nothing else. And so, so what's happening? Particularly when you get people that are in uh, facilities, they don't have the ability to get up and leave and go out when they choose to and when they want to. And so their world keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. The news gives you a chance to see what's going on out there in the world more. Now, I don't necessarily think that that's all, always such a good thing to let us sit around and watch. Because there's a lot of things. The, the news media anymore have really focused on striving on the negative. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way for several years. But they feed off the negative. 
Well, what did I tell you bothers us? Fear, anxiety, and stress. Well, some of those things they tell us, even though they may or may not be true, is going to feed into those three categories. So I probably watch less of the news now than I used to because I realize, oh, wait a minute. If, if I start watching that, I'm liable to get worked up over it. <laughs> if I don't need to get worked up over it because I can't affect how it changes one way or the other. So here again, it's, it's a matter of kind of trying to be aware and, and, and then dictate to it. If, if, you're in a, if you're working in a facility and they're all worried about the news, and if you see it working them up, if it's not working them up, then maybe you don't worry about it. But if it is, oh, isn't it time for Wheel of Fortune? Yeah. Let's see if we can let's see if we can figure out the words on Wheel of Fortune. You know, and instead of watching another, because you know we've got hours and hours and hours of news on every day. Good gracious, I don't think there's that much news in the world. But they sure seem to think there is. And if you didn't hear it this time, we're going to tell it fifteen other times. Um, can you tell us um, what a typical day is like for you? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, okay. My wife still works. <coughs> uh, two things. We need the money, and she needs the insurance. I, I'm on Social Security Disability. Of course, now I'm finally eligible for Social Security, but it won't change anything. So, but now I've got Medicare. So. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but, so she still gets up and goes to work. She works at St. Anthony Hospital, has for 18 years. And so, typical morning, like this morning, or this, this morning's not a typical morning. Typical morning, we'll get up, she'll get up, go in there and shower. By the time she gets out of the shower, I'll go in and start fix, excuse me, fixing us some kind of breakfast. Because here, part of the situation is, since she has taken on more of the role of the provider, and I'm home, I see very little sense in her coming home, washing clothes, cleaning the house. Now, I've really gotten bad about cleaning the house lately. I really have. I've really let that, I've neglected that a lot. I'm going to have to get on myself and get back to doing that. But I try to take care of the house. I try to take care of the laundry and stuff like that. So she doesn't have to. She doesn't have to come home and then start becoming a housewife as soon as she hits the front door. So I try to I try to fix breakfast. And we've kind of gotten in a routine lately where we both like smoothies. So I'll go in and I'll fix us our smoothies and then I'll go in there and tell her your, your smoothie's ready and, and then lunch varies what she does for lunch. A lot of times she she'll take a, a you know a protein shake or various different what she might take and I'll generally try to have that over in her bag ready for her to get, get that done mm -hmm. and then uh, she usually leaves the house somewhere around 7 around 7 15 it can be she doesn't have to leave that early but she likes to get to work get set up and be prepared and everything but around 7 15 then she'll leave and I'll sit down and I will read my daily devotion on my tablet. I'll, I'll read it. And I'll check my emails. And now that it's baseball season, I'll usually try to watch the highlights of last night's games, if I can find them. And then uh, 9 o'clock, the 700 Club comes on, and I'll try to watch the 700 Club. Somewhere during it, I will fall asleep during, during that nearly consistent. I get woke up because the show that comes on after that is one of those two people coming before a judge and arguing. And I don't like watching that. So when I hear something get loud, I'll wake up and turn channels. And so, uh, but then then it just varies as to what I'll do. Uh, I just don't have, typically don't have much of an active day. So my day, in a nutshell, is trying to help Vicki prepare to leave, and then later in the day, I start getting mentally prepared for her to come home. Highlight of my day, she comes home. Now, the sad thing about that is, I'm all excited she's coming home, she's all wore out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like, uh, but, it, but a typical day is it's, it's just pretty much, 
We live in a condominium now. We've kind of simplified things and downsized and moved into condominium. They are quite familiar with me up in the office because I'll roll up there a few times a week and visit with them and maybe help with a little bit of this or help with that mm -hmm. if, if they need it. But we've got a swimming pool there at the condominium and I'm yet to get in it this summer. I could be up there swimming during the day, but I just hadn't done it. How much do you remember? What'd you ask? <laughs> How much do you remember? <laughs> it depends on what. Sometimes my wife tells me I remember too much. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes she says I remember a little too well. Uh, I still, actually, I still am doing quite well. Uh, there's some, just like when she asked a question a little bit ago, I did, I did lose the second part of the question, but it came back. Mm -hmm. Short-term memory is, is worse than it was. Long-term memory still is pretty good. Pretty good. Now, I've always loved music, and we used to go to concerts a lot when, when we were dating, and been quite a few even since we've been married. I used to could tell you, if you, know, if you asked me, can you sing this group? Yes. In their first set, they played this song, this song, this song, this song. They took a break, and then they played this song, this song, this song. Now I can say, yeah, song. Mm -hmm. Okay? So some of that is, is not as complete as it used to be. Uh, but for all, all, all intent and purposes, I'm not going to complain about how things are. I, I don't do checkbooks anymore. My wife takes care of the checkbook. I don't take, I don't take responsibility for that. I still drive. And my in the neuropsych test that I took, the, the, they told me said you, you react, your reaction time and, and your processing time is still good. But I, I choose when I drive. I choose the times I drive. I don't drive during rush hour. I typically don't drive places that I, if I drive places I have not been before, I'll put it into the GPS and follow it. So I'm not having to try to read street signs and all that. I'm just listening to the commands and watching traffic. But I. I don't drive, I don't have a need to get up and drive every day, and I don't. There's days, there's days my car will sit there, there have been times to sit there a whole week and I've never gotten in it to go anywhere. And then most of the time when Vicki and I get out to go somewhere, she drives. If, if I can tell she's real tired, I may get in the car and drive. Our daughter lives over in Bethany, which isn't very far, two granddaughters. If we're going over there, I may get in there and drive, just to keep her from having to. But uh, so I, I do know, I do know, and recognize some of the changes. But I'm still not, I'm not overly concerned about any of it right now. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, I know, unless something happens, what's to come. And I just really don't typically want to focus too much on that. I don't want to. I don't want to evaluate where I'm at as to where I'm going because I know where I'm going, and I don't want to look at that picture. Mm -hmm. And I don't evaluate where I'm at as to where I was because I don't like where I'm at as opposed to where I was. So I just try to be real content where I'm at. So can you say you have good days and then not so good days? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mr. Ron, do you have a consistent routine that you keep every day or, um, and also with that, do you also write notes as a reminder? I don't write too many notes. One thing I don't have a whole lot of to do. So, but I do, I do try to put things on my smartphone, on my calendar, if, if I have things that I, I need to, to do or it's coming up in a week or a few days or something, a month. I try to put it on my calendar. I don't always get them on there to do a verb. Uh, but I, I, I try to, to do that and, and use that as a, as a help and an aid. I haven't got to the point that I write too many notes. Every once in a while I'll write myself a note. If I've forgotten something several times that I wanted to do and I go, oh, I need to do that tomorrow, and I've already forgotten to do it a couple of days, I may put me a sticky note on the mirror in the bathroom. So in the morning when I get up, I'll see it. So you don't have a routine for every day. It's just different. Okay. And, and, and 
because I, I, I recognize that, well, I tell this, I found out here a few months ago, start clipping my fingernails or my toenails, I'd clip nine of them and leave one. <laughs> go figure. I don't know why. But, I mean, first time I did that, the next day I'm sitting there and I go, oh, I looked at my thumbnail and I said, I need to clip my fingernails. And I go, wait a minute, you did that yesterday. <laughs> and didn't do that one. So now what I have to do is I clip my fingernails and then I go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Done. Instead of just making the assumption I'm done. Now, what happened in that process? Did something get my attention? Or did I break a routine of the way I used to? The, 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 my, my, what do they call that? Uh, memory? Uh, muscle memory. My muscle memory of how I used to clip my fingernails, did I do it different? And that's why I missed it? I don't know. But I, I've noticed I've had to start uh, paying a little more attention to that. And I've also noticed something else. A lot of times, if I can't do something right now, don't keep pushing and pushing and pushing because then I get frustrated. Back off from it, leave it alone, come back to it in a little bit. Because a lot of times when I come back to it in a little bit, I'll be able to do it. Or if I can't remember something, don't just keep going, oh, what is that, what is that, what is that? Let it settle a while and then come back to it a little later. And an awful lot of the time, I'll be able to recover. And of course, a lot of times under that, I'm also going, Lord, help me remember that. Lord, how do I do that? You know, that's a silent prayer I pray an awful lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Asking for help and remember it. And I think he honors it. But we'll be sitting around, we'll be sitting around talking about something. Vicki and I go, now, what was that or who was that? And she can't remember and I can't remember. And I'll say, okay, Lord, who was that? And then, Five minutes to two hours later, I'll tell Vicky. Vicky, she oh, that's right. <laughs> you know. So, uh, but but as you work with us, was it Mary Berry? Was that that lady we met? I meant to look that up today. Up in Ohio, that had that. No, in Minnesota. Yeah, and she's in Minnesota. We yeah, met her in Ohio. Judy, Judy Berry. Yeah. If if you get a chance. To Google Judy Berry in Alzheimer's. She set up a, a, a residential facility up in Minnesota, and she took a totally, totally different approach to how to, to cope with and deal with advanced people with Alzheimer's and dementia. She actually took patients that facility said, no, we can't handle them anymore. you got to take them out of here. And she took them. And some of the techniques, now, let me say this. Hers was, hers was a non-profit. She had a lot of uh, outside donors helping support it and all. And so it's, it's one of those things that... Uh, you're not going to find corporations doing it. But there's things you can glean from the way she did hers that can help you as an individual is you're dealing with individuals. And if you just took one or two of those techniques she, she used, you'd be surprised at how much difference it made. Because most of the problems that people with advanced dementia, most of the problems that you as a, as a, as a caregiver have with us can be worked around. Because it's something internally that we're dealing with that's causing us problems, causing us frustrations, and it comes out. And guess who's going to catch it? The closest person around. You're going to be the one that's going to catch it. So how do you deal with it? Throw up a wall and get defensive? Well, that's just going to make worse. So how do you deal with it? And those are some of the things that, that first of all, will make your job easier will make your experience more enjoyable with those people, make you pretty happy, like, hey, I was successful in helping this person. Instead of just making them do something or forcing them to do something. You know, when, when I worked for the Department of Corrections, we had the mental health unit, uh, and we had some bad, bad cases. I mean, they were locked down. I mean, 
I don't think they use that term anymore, but criminally insane is what some of these people were. And, and I remember they'd call me over there to talk to some of those people from time to time because they, they'd say that they, they weren't going to take their meds anymore. They were well, didn't need their meds. So they don't need their meds anymore. Well, they're fixing to force Medicaid. And force Medicaid is not a pretty thing. It's not a pretty thing for somebody doing it or having it done to you. It's not pretty. And so they try not to do that. So they call me over sometimes to talk to some of them. Well, in the process, of, I, I go over there and I, well, I got to talk with Jesus once. And I got to talk with Timothy. I got to talk with Paul. You know, these people, that's who they thought they were. And, and, and this one guy, this one guy, Timothy, thought he's Timothy. And he wasn't going to take his medicine anymore. He didn't need meds. I said, okay. Well, I said, I understand that, Timothy. But I said, let me ask you something, Timothy. Didn't Paul write you one time and tell you to take a little wine for the health of your stomach? Yes, he did. I said, did it work? Yes, it did. I said, well, maybe you could just look at that medication as the wine of today that Paul told you about back then. Because you know they're not going to give you any wine in here. No, I know they're not going to do that. I could try that. Okay. And so he took his meds. Well, I didn't try to tell him, no, you're not Timothy, and you're, you're, you're delusional, and you need your medication, and you better take it. If I'd have done that, I'd have gotten nowhere with him. But I entered into his reality, used his reality to make him comply with what we wanted to do. Well, you can do the same thing with us. Can't you? A whole lot of the time. Didn't you do that? You're talking about with me, yeah. No, not with you. But with me. Gail. You working with Gail. Weren't you able to get her to comply with you at times that wow. if you'd have fought her, find, you find ways. Yes. And so you being the professionals going out there, that will be some of your challenge, is to learn how to do those type of things. And actually, you'll walk away from it feeling wonderful mm -hmm. because you were successful in helping that person. Good gracious. And that's what you, you wouldn't be going into this if you wouldn't want to help people. And let me tell you something. If you get enough people yelling at you, screaming at you, cussing at you, kicking at you, fighting at you, you're going to eventually get kicked off and say, I, I don't, this isn't what I signed on for. <laughs> so learn how to change that. Because you'd be surprised how much of the time you will have the power to change that. Mr. Ryan, yes, so what do you offer in a suggestion in dealing with anyone, in those that are of retired military, <coughs> if you encounter any in a, in a support group, how? That's how, what most of ours was to start with. <laughs> yes. Retired Vietnam veterans. Well, not so, just that, but, but yes. Mm -hmm. you know, so um, go ahead and ask your question. Um, that's what I was asking. What what suggestions do you offer in dealing with someone, especially who's retired of high rank? and they just think they know everything and well, you can't help them and they're in denial on top of it. So uh, what do you offer as far as a suggestion on how Sounds like a major that's out there at that on the longest study, doesn't it? Yeah. Except <laughs> okay. In that, you've got to be creative. And here, ladies, this is where you have a chance to, y'all get have a chance to shine. Show y'all's acting ability. Show your creativity. <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute. I know y'all can act. Y'all can act with plenty of drama when you need to. Now, listen to me. Your, your boyfriend and your husband. Listen to me. Didn't I tell you? Now, come on. Okay. So, this is just another, you get to act another role. But in someone with military, and, and or yeah. I, I'm just going to talk in general terms. Yeah. It's something like that. if they're a high ranking officer and something like that. You, first of all, you treat them with the respect that they're accustomed to being treated at with that rank. Yes, That's sir. the only way you're even going to have them listen to you. And then you get into their reality and see where are they at and what is it they're trying to, to uh, what is it they're coming against and then look around. And, and, okay, for instance, I'm just going to talk out of a fake scenario. You've got, you've got a colonel that... You're not going to tell him this. He, he knows this and all that. Well, well, Colonel, yes, sir, I understand that and I respect that. And, and sir, may I respectfully ask you, didn't HQ send down 
some different instructions on that just recently. I seem to remember some memos that HQ sent down recently. I didn't see those memos. Oh, well, I'm sorry we didn't get you a copy of that, sir. But what, until we can get those to you, can we do this? And, and you, know, you, I mean, you just have to act it out and play it out. But, but what you've done is you still respect them as the person. They're going back on what their learned memory. You haven't, you haven't insulted that. You've played it with it. And, and you, just, you just take it. And, and that's where you have to know, that's where you have to know your patients. You have to know a little bit about their personality, a little bit about their background. And that's where it's going to behoove y'all to learn a little bit of who these people are that you're dealing with. Take you a little bit of time, take you a little bit of effort, but it'll pay off big time for you. My mother-in-law, back, back in December of last year, December 1st, had a stroke, wound up in the hospital. She was dead by the end of January, okay? But while she was in a, a nursing home, she went from skilled and then had to put her in a nursing home. There was a lady that it is pretty late in the evening. She pulled up near the front door, and of course, you know, they have those beepers at the front door. If you get too close, the alarms on the wheelchairs and all. And, and I, I sat there and, and I go, I walk up to her. I suspected she had dementia, some of her actions. I asked her, I said, Could I help you? She looked up at me, she said, I'm looking for my husband. I said, Oh, is he here? And she said, yes. And I said, well, let me help you look for him. So I grabbed her wheelchair. We started walking down the, 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 the halls. Well, I was 99% sure he had gone home for the evening. And he had. Well, he didn't take her. So he had to still be there. So we're walking down. And so I get her to talking about her husband. And she is. I said, well, does he come see you every day? Yes, he, every day he comes and sees me. She said, I think he may be up on the second floor. I said, well, let's look the first floor real close. There was no second floor. Let's look real close here on the first floor and see if we can find him. And we're walking down through there. And one of the ladies at the desk, we went walking by, and she said, she told me as I walked by, she said, she's playing you. I said, no, ma'am, she is not. She is not playing. And we walked on around, and, and in the process of walking, I told her, I said, you know, what would be the chances maybe your husband was like, I've had to slip on out of here? Because it's getting late, and if he's going to come see you tomorrow, he's going to need to be rested. Do you think maybe he slipped on out of here and went home so he could get to bed early? You know, I bet you he did. And I said, well, where would you like me to take you? Well, just take me on back to my room. Yeah, it took a little bit of time. But I, all I did is enter into her reality for a little bit, listened a little bit, and for, I don't know, for the staff, I don't know how much trouble she might have been because she's getting worked up because her, she, she, her husband wasn't there. So it, it gives you a chance. You'll have a chance to... To do, I've got a lot of, I've got an awful lot of old lady girlfriends up there at that place. <laughs> so, you know, I left my wife to sit and talk with her mother a lot, so I was out talking to the old ladies because the old ladies, there's more old ladies in those places than there are old men anyway. So they were all very quick and willing. They'd pull up to the table at supper time, pull up to look at me, and say, "Can I sit by you while we eat?" And I said, "Yeah, you can sit by me while you eat." And so you know, it, people will respond to. You. And it's incredible. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably get you to tell a couple of stories, Herb, if you don't mind. Has he got time to tell us? Mm -hmm. It's not my mm -hmm. show. I know, but, but tell the story about the monkeys. Okay. And that'll give them a, an idea of what kind of a... Yeah, it's... I tell you, we, uh, we designed... We have a uh, 25 rules of Alzheimer's caregiving. And it's kind of what... Uh, I kind of started it off because of all the landmines that I stepped on in 11 years of doing it because we're, we're brought up to be, to use reasoning and logic. And those things don't exist in the Alzheimer's world. So you've got to stop doing those things. And we, you know, on my side, the caregiver side of, the, of our support group, every week, 
for every other weekend we have is I'm telling somebody, you know, you're trying to, you're not living in their world. You, if you guys want to get along, you know, the spouses want to get along, they have got to give up and go to their world. And one of the one of the examples was there was a lady. She said uh, to her husband, "There's a bunch of monkeys out in the trees in the backyard." Well, he was smart enough that he was not going to argue with her about it because the typical thing you're going to do is, ah, oh, come on, honey, there's no tree, there's no monkeys in the trees in the backyard. What he did was took her back out on the patio, and they watched the trees or the monkeys in the trees in the backyard. And that's that's kind of the thing you got to do. You know, another well, one was the well, guy that well, yeah, where the, where the kids were coming. Yeah, in the, the house. kids were coming in the house. She thought, and and you know, and in their minds, this is reality to them. Kids were coming into the house and they were getting into her stuff and that really bothered her and she was not able to you know, get out and chase them out. So he said, uh, well, where are they, honey? And well, they're out in the backyard again. I said, okay, well, I'll go talk to him. So he goes out in the backyard and fools around for 15, 20 minutes. Comes back in and says, ah, honey, I got it figured out. And she said, well, what's the deal? And he said, they're hungry. They're, they were coming in there looking for snacks. And so he said, I'm just going to put a, a, a box of vanilla wafers out on the uh, the patio uh, table, and you know they said that they wouldn't come back in, and then, that satisfied her. It, it put her at ease. That in, in her world, that that made sense. And you know, it, it wasn't that the kids were doing bad things to her, but they were just getting into her stuff, and that bothered her. So, you know, you guys have got to find that that thing. You know, and I've seen this young know, Gail was in a facility for four years, and and I saw you all doing great things, and I saw some that, that weren't. You know, that some that were just they were tired, they were frustrated, and, you know, they were just, come on, we're going to go do this, come on, we're going to go do that. Well, there's ways, like Ron has described, to, to, to get into their world and to make them want to do what needs to be done. So, well, and with that in mind, with that in mind, makes your job more pleasant. And you can walk away feeling like, I really made a, a change today. I've done good today. And all of us want to enjoy our jobs. Nobody wants to, first of all, none of us particularly want to work, but we all have to work. So if you're going to work, enjoy it. Make it pleasant and contribute. And you have an opportunity to contribute big time. Really do. Y'all have any questions for either one of us? I do. Um, so you have early onset. Whatever they tell me. <laughs> Actually, they call it younger onset now. Because there's early stage, which is somebody at any age that has the is early into it, and younger onset. So that that's kind of the official thing: is younger onset, and then early stage. So he's both. I have a question: Is there is there anything that will trigger your stress, anxiety, or fear? And if so. What are those, and what do you do, do to <laughs> calm those? Now, what, as, as caregivers, what can we do to calm those for you? Wow. Good question. Excellent, excellent. Some of the things that do bother me and have bothered me, one that bothered me real bad is loud noises. Okay. Loud, sharp noises. My wife can be in the kitchen and pull a pan out from underneath the stove and it clang together, and I probably come this high up off the chair in the living room. Uh, feedback, like it's church, when you know, the sound man doesn't get the sound right and feedback comes, it's as if you take two ice picks and just cram them in yeah. my ear. And it hurts. And sometimes it literally will hurt the next day still. Uh, Herb's experienced this one, so you can watch his face as I describe it. There is a limit to uh, go to a restaurant. The, the, the noise in there. And I think what it amounts to, both sometimes visually and audible, uh, audible, is there's so much going on that there's so much input coming into the brain, it's trouble processing. And noises do that to me. And used to being around people, I love, used to, I got to where for a while I wouldn't go into crowds at all. And I'm still very cautious. But in, in restaurants, we were in Washington, D.C., table right over from us. There was about six or eight of us, probably maybe eight or ten of us at our table. And over the table just beside us was a young couple with a, a, a child. Uh, I'm going to guess the child probably wasn't two, maybe two. 
and they'd been there a week, long time, way longer than that kid was going to be patient for. And earlier in the night, I looked at, at the child and thought, oh, isn't that a cute little girl? Well, after a while, she's getting fussy. Uh, uh. And then she starts screaming out every once in a while. And then she starts screaming out a little more. And then a little more. And by this time, and, and I have tremors. And, and as my tremors get worse, my wife knows it's time to do something. Get me out of there or something. Well, this little kid kept screaming. Well, the mom and dad already had their stuff in the to-go bag. Hadn't left, but they had it in the to-go bag. And then the dad decides he wants some more of the dessert. So he pulls it out of the to-go bag, gives his wife some, he starts eating it, the little kid wants some of it, he won't give it to the little kid, so the kid starts screaming, literally screaming. Well, I'm way up here, and I don't remember what I said to the dad, but I made a comment to the dad. Uh, you were, let me put it this way, that this was happening over here, he was over, he came across the table. <laughs> Well, I spoke to the dad. Uh, well, several of us went and spoke to the dad. Aaron did. Yeah. Aaron went. Aaron went and talked to him. Cause, and, and that's a shame. Because I, I shouldn't. But sometimes it almost just creeps up on me. That kind of stuff. But luckily, my wife, and I don't know why she didn't that night. I really don't. I don't know if she wasn't paying attention. And she's usually very sensitive. There's been a couple of times she's dropped the ball. And if it gets too far gone, I'm on the verge of not being controlled. And I don't like that. But it's just like, where do I run? I, I've got to find somewhere to escape. I've got to get away from this. This is a problem we have at the uh, walk in Alzheimer's. Uh, we've got 10,000 people, and there's a video screen with a tremendous amount of, you know, they're playing loud music. And um, so this year we have because Ron and, and some of the rest of them have told us about this, and, and I know it because of my wife too. We have a we we'll have a quiet area where they can get in and out of the, the noise, and then we can pull them back out for the ceremony when things quiet down. And we really need to have them there to participate. But there's in crowds. I, I used to and, and the thing about crowds. Used to I was afraid I'd lose Vicky. If I couldn't find Vicky, I'd panic. We one of the first walks we went to. I was standing there, I turned around and she was gone. She probably wasn't 10 or 15 feet from me. I could, I could not focus on her. All I could see is this mass of people moving and all this. And I almost became a track star. The only reason I didn't is because I didn't know where to run. I wanted to run. Just which way am I supposed to run? Which is going to be a safe way to run? Am I running into stuff or away from stuff? I didn't know. And I think he wasn't but a few feet away, but I couldn't see her. And for a long, long time, I would not let Vicky, if we were out in public, I wouldn't let her get more than arm's length from me. Then I tricked her. <laughs> Went in one Saturday morning when we was getting ready to go shopping. And uh, I said, what are, you, what are you wearing today? And she said, well, I think I'll wear my blue jeans and this green top. So I went in there and I found me a green shirt. <laughs> so I knew if we got separated, I didn't have to try to remember what she was wearing. She's got a green shirt on. Oh, oh, yeah. And I did that for a long time before she ever figured out what I was doing. You were lucky it wasn't St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> we don't, we don't, I would have suggested a different shirt. <laughs> but but, but I, 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 I have tried to try to come up with coping skills to do that. And some of it's been just as simple as early on we'd go into Walmart and I couldn't stand all the motion of all the people. And I'd go into Walmart and I'd turn to Big say, I'll be in the car. And I'd just walk out to the car. Well now I have learned to kind of shut everything down and pull my focus in so I don't see all that stuff. I'm a typical uh, oblivious Walmart shopper now. I look like a typical Walmart shop. <laughs> you was going to ask something, Sarah. You had your hand up. Oh, uh, I just remember one of the things that um, I heard caregivers and people that were professional professional caregivers saying that bath time or shower time could be yes. a really hard chore. Yes. And I remember being told this, and it made a lot of sense. And I don't know if you guys have heard this, but 
is the equivalent of a stranger walking into your bedroom, taking your clothes off, and putting you in a body of water, um, not knowing what's going on. Mm -hmm. Did you ever come across caregivers that had some solutions for that, or had any tricks that made that a bit easier? How many times we dreamed about that when we were teenagers? <laughs> and now it's scary, right? Tongue in, tongue in cheek, okay? Vicki wants to get me in the shower, all she has to do is get in there first. Okay? I may have Alzheimer's, but I know if she gets in there, I'm going to go too. But typically she makes me go, she makes me go to my own shower. But no, her probably could address that better because really, you know, that's, that, that becomes the problem with this disease is, is sometimes you forget the very people that, that you're married to or your, your children and all that, and all of a sudden they just become strangers. And golly, that's got to be tough. And here again, that's just where you've got to become creative. Mm -hmm. Showers are a fearful thing. That's a real struggle. I mean, I, I love your system that you have here in the apartment with the little track that you can do it in, but that, but that was a fight every night that we did it. Did you ever find anything that helped? No. I mean, the only way I could get her into the shower, and it wasn't that big of a lift that she I mean, it's great in facilities where you don't have that lift at all. Uh, but the only way I could get her to take to get into the shower. I, I had to wear a bathing suit. It's kind of not, not the same situation. <laughs> she was kind of embarrassed about all that, but I would uh, I would just have to get her enough off balance that she would take that first step and then I could get her in. But, and then she didn't mind so much what was going on after that, you know, the washing part of it. But, uh, you know, and sometimes I've heard that, you know, they look at that drain and they think it's a hole, uh, anything dark. Here's, here was one too. We went to uh, IHOP one time up in Edmond, and they had changed their <clears throat> entryway. They put the flat white rock in there, but they put a black uh, mortar that was in between it, and she refused to take that. She would not step into that at all. I mean, we just had to turn around and finally go home because it was a big enough area. There was just no way around it. So it's you know, so you got to understand what their their fears are. Somebody, you know, they put. I've heard some facilities that they don't want them to go to a door, they'll put a black uh, mat by the door, and that's a hole to them when they want to go near it. Some facilities, mm -hmm. if they want them to walk, they'll have a light colored wood from the uh, walls out to the, the dark colored wood from the walls out to the center part, and then they'll have like a, a white or a yellow wood, and you know, that's, that's where they'll walk on. They, they don't want to get on that dark side. Depth perception can, can get tricky. And I've had I've had some issues from time to time with that. Uh, you know, if I, I go to pick up glass and I knock it over, and, just, you know. and so I would probably this sounds over over simplified, but probably one of the biggest tools you'll have is talking, calm, soft, and reaffirming. And whatever you're saying, handle it, handle it in that manner. And I think you, you, you will probably find that to be a huge, huge tool for you. Because uh, you know we, we've lost our, we, we're, we're, we're lost our independence. We're losing our independence. Now let me say this, and, and this, it, it's not a bad analogy as it sounds. But I, even before this disease, I always made a parallel comparison of prison to nursing homes. And, and here I'll explain, I'll explain how I do it. An inmate in prison has been told he's going to go there. And he goes there, he's taken, all his rights are taken away. He, he can't drive, he's told when to eat. He's told which bathrooms to use. He's told when to go to bed. He's told when to get up. His life is dictated to him. He has very few choices. Who does that sound like? Someone in a nursing home. They don't want to be there. It's the last place they want to be. Somebody's made them go there, usually their loved ones, so they're tipped off at them. 
They, they, you've taken away their license. You've taken away their checkbook. You've taken away their money. They don't know what's happening to all that stuff. You're telling them when they eat. You're telling them what to eat. You're telling them when to go to bed. You're telling them when to go to get up. You're telling them when to take a shower. I mean, what's the difference in it in prison? You can say, oh, well, yeah, they can't walk out the door when they want. So it, it is an end-of-life prison. But I also have seen inmates that were almost deliriously happy at where they were at because they learned to live in the environment. And you can help these people learn to live in their environment. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. But actually, I'm, I've, in some respects, I, first of all, I admire you. And I respect you for what you're doing. But I'm a little bit envious, too, because I used to get to help people. I don't get to help people and y'all are getting ready to go out there to where you're going to be helping people all day long every day. And sometimes it's just the sweet little smile you give them or the reassuring touch. You'd, you'd be surprised how much just a, 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 a soft hand on the shoulder and a little rub. Like a puppy dog. <laughs> it, it, you, you, you have that ability. And you're getting ready to have that chance to use it. That's great. That's great. I have babbled and I don't want you to get in the book. <laughs> so if there's if no more questions or anything else, we'll cut and run. Let y'all get on with the rest of your class. But thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for what y'all are preparing yourselves to do. It's very admirable. And you still are a Because you gave us an insight. Well, I try to. And, and 